Aya practices writing her name over and over again. She is eight years old and loves to learn. She is also a Syrian refugee. There are now one million Syrian refugee children spread across the region. Aya is one of them. She has seen war firsthand, experienced flight. Home for her and her six brothers and sisters is this makeshift tent in Lebanon's Beka Valley. Her father's pride and joy was that he had been able to educate his children, boys and girls alike. Aya has not been to school for two years now and has little prospect of going soon. Aya keeps busy helping around the house and looking after her disabled sister. A whole generation of Syrian children like Aya have been affected by this conflict. Their lives and futures on hold as the violence continues, unabated. Some children have to go to work, others are marrying young. But all of them will never forget what they have lived through. Aya can't look into the future. She doesn't know if she can go back to Syria. She finds a way to smile, clinging to those that are most dear to her, and dreams of an end to the war. شفت إنه بصير ضرب والعالم ياك بتموت وشي عالم محترقة هاي العالم ما سهيت من الحرب ومن الضرب صرنا صر صرنا إن أنا 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 صر صرت نادي له يا أبا كان في أخواتي وأنا والبابا والماما هن هن بسوي أحلى شجر وحياتي يعني شفته والعصافير والطيور والهيدي بسد بيتي يعني هلا الطيور فتصب بالجو ما في حدا طعميهم والشجر يبيس ما في حدا بشربه يعني أنا أول شي هيك مثل الحلم يعني أنا هلا مت يعني شفتها هيك مثل الحلم يعني شي تيجي عليهم الطياد بزيد عليهم شي شي تغصفهم بالرصاص إلي مش شايفة عبير سنة ورجع على بلدي وعلى المدرسة على رفاقي حاسلة ماشي بس بس وقت أهلي هيك هيك تأثرت علي كتير حبوني ولا بحبوني كتير I scrambled to get food before it's all gone. There's no orderly queue here, but it helps to be small. 
This kitchen feeds thousands daily, many of them children. For many, this is their only meal today. Faleh, Zidan, Randa and Dilnaz have just collected food for four displaced families. Faleh and Zaydan are cousins and best friends. For them, food was not an issue back home in Sinjar. But since fleeing two weeks ago, their lives have changed drastically. Too much for some to take. <laughs> Falah, his sister and two cousins walk more than a kilometer to get food for their families back at the shelter. The daily journey is long, but few things compare to surviving the harsh conditions on top of Sinjar Mountain. Food here is served only to the young. Adults eat as little as one meal a day to save more for the children. Falah is only 14. But on that mountain, he had to be strong beyond his years. Since leaving Sinjar, Falah has nightmares that his home is blown up and many people die. His eight-year-old sister, Randa, misses her friends the most. Here she recalls their names. Randa is at second grade. The school and playground are her life. The older boys finding it harder to adjust. These children feel responsible for their families now. They help protect and fend for them. They have grown all too quickly. Their childhood days, fragments of the past.
Welcome to Kampong Tong, cradle of Pol Pot, the sadly famous Khmer Rouge leader. This is where we meet Chin Met on a journey through history. Enrolled by the Khmer Rouge at the age of 17, she has decided to witness against former Khmer Rouge leaders on trial today. When I come back to my native village, I feel sad because I've lost all I had here. Just like her village, Chin Met still bears the marks of that painful era. My mother was dead. I was brought up by my aunt, and then I was called in to be a Khmer Rouge soldier. When I came home, all my relatives were dead. My uncle, my great aunt, and the 20 friends who had been enrolled with me. Chin Met's life changed drastically in 1974, when she was enrolled by the Khmer Rouge along with all the other young people in her village. She didn't yet know she was about to serve a regime of terror which would lead to the death of some two million Cambodians, around one-fifth of the country's population. It's in this very school that Chin Met and her fellow female recruits were re-educated by the party to serve the revolution. They trained us to be tough, not to think about our relatives or our parents. We had to sacrifice everything, including our personal belongings. Chin Met was then taught how to use weapons. On the battlefield, her female unit was in charge of carrying ammunition and evacuating the wounded. When the Khmer Rouge walked on Phnom Penh in 1975, the women were in charge of cleaning up the houses of those chased from their homes. When I was cleaning up the people's belongings, I saw dead bodies in the houses. The Khmer Rouge soldiers evacuated the town over three days. Everyone had to leave. There were people who didn't want to leave their belongings behind, and old people who didn't want to or couldn't leave their homes. They were killed on the spot. She was then sent to work in the fields by the Khmer regime. At first, when we worked in the rice fields, we were well fed. But then we were given only a bit of rice mixed with tree roots, maize or swamp cabbage. My group started to rebel. As a result, she was sent to Phnom Penh's infamous Tuol Sleng prison, otherwise known as S-21. More than 12,000 people died in this former school turned into a prison camp. This picture was taken when I was arrested. I was 19. This is my friend from the same village as me. This is another friend. This one was the group leader. They're all dead. I was held captive here. There were three of us in here for nearly a month. I could hear the sound of blows and screams coming from upstairs. That's where I was interrogated and tortured. I still have the scars. She survived the death camp and was sent to work in another camp. S24, which is now a prison. She spent two years there, along with women and children, half of whom didn't survive the working conditions. It was hell, worse than death. I worked the fields, I was tortured. I built dams, I dug dikes. We pulled the cart instead of oxes to plow the fields. My feet were full of sores, my face was covered with skin disease. We were so thin that when we crouched, our knees reached up over our heads. When the Vietnamese took over Phnom Penh in 1979, the Khmer Rouge forced her to flee to the mountains with them. She was captured by the Vietnamese a year later and then released. After years of silence, Chin Met decided to face up to the past by bearing witness at the trials of former Khmer Rouge leaders. The first opened in 2009. She was the first female survivor to testify against Doik, former head of the S-21 and S-24 camps. Oh, the 
It takes time to forget past sorrows. I can't forget. Even though the court has condemned former Khmer Rouge leaders, until this day, I haven't forgotten anything. For a while, Chinmet lived in fear of reprisals from families of those who were put on trial. It's the price to pay, she says, to be rehabilitated as a member of her community and help build a better future for her country. She will be called in to witness again at future trials. It's important to win the trials against those who are still alive, so that Cambodians and the new generation know the truth about what happened. And it will set an example for today's leaders, so they don't follow in the steps of the Khmer Rouge. Many Cambodians still bear the weight of history. Join us for the next chapter of our Cambodian edition of Women in War and meet David Tit, whose life is spent helping others cope with the past.